Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Claire, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Hi, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm Claire Prentice. I'm the author of four nonfiction books, uh, Lost Tribe of Coney Island, Miracle at Coney Island, Curse of Riches, and Dr. Icepick, which we're here to talk about today. Uh, I'm from Edinburgh, Scotland, but have lived all over, uh, including in New York, Washington, D.C., Boston, and Charlottesville, Virginia, which is where I did a lot of the research for Dr. Icepick uh, while I was on fellowship with Virginia Humanities there. Now, how'd you get interested in your book, Dr. Icepick? Like, how'd you come across Walter Friedman? I mean, he's an interesting character from what I've heard so far. Yeah. A fascinating character, yeah. Um, do you know, I honestly don't remember how I first heard about him, um, but I do remember the first time, time I, I came across his name and began reading just being completely kind of horrified and fascinated you know he seemed to have such a complex and and grim legacy um and you know reading about his lobotomies and his particularly later his ice pick surgery i was just like you know how how did this happen how was he ever allowed to do this and how was he so convinced that he was doing good with this um so uh, that would have been around 2017 I first came across him and I just read everything I could find. Uh, I applied to do a fellowship in Virginia um, and that obviously put me closer to West Virginia, which was where he did um, the West Virginia Lobotomy Project, which became the focus of my book. Um, and, you know, just visiting archives there and looking at some of the the patient records that he kept, most of which are redacted and outside researchers cannot access. It's only patients who have since died or who died during surgery whose files I could see. Um, and, you know, he Freeman famously took photographs of all of his patients. He took a before photograph, he took photographs during surgery. So he would actually stop the surgery, maybe ice pick in place, take a picture, and then he would take another picture afterwards. And so these files of patients, some of whom were as young as his youngest ever patient was four years old. His oldest patient was in their eighties. Um, and these files with these photographs and these you know, very matter of fact descriptions of them and why they're having the operation were just really compelling. I mean, absolutely revolting and you know would make you squirm but just really fascinating I became really intrigued by you know why did society at the time not just the medical establishment but you know society in general and the public why was it embraced as this miracle cure it was seen to be and um, just became really interesting to me obviously it came at a time when psychiatric medicine there wasn't a lot of funding there weren't really alternatives and um, psychiatric hospitals were really overcrowded. Often the staff who worked there had, didn't have all that much training, particularly nursing staff, auxiliaries. Um, and really they were warehouses. They were places where people were put away and forgotten about and treatments that did exist uh, were very crude, you know, water therapies. There was uh, insulin shock therapy where you were, you know, shocked and that was hoped that it, somehow it would kind of scramble the wires in your brain and have a positive outcome. Um, electroconvulsive therapy, which obviously was used with more success, uh, they were still questionable. And, you know, this was the backdrop. The, you know, people with schizophrenia, maybe alcoholics, people with depression, anxiety, there wasn't really a lot of hope for them and they were hidden away. They were often seen as an embarrassment by their families. Um, and, you know, against this backdrop, Walter Freeman genuinely when he started out, wanted to do good and wanted to bring hope to these people and their families. Um, and he worked in St. Elizabeth's, which was the largest psychiatric hospital in America in Washington, DC. And he saw so much human suffering and degradation and he really wanted 
to make the, the lives of people suffering from these conditions better. Um, and he made it his life's work to find a way to do that. Um, and he, in 1935, became aware of the work of Egos Mon Antonio Egos Mones, who was a Portuguese neurologist. Um, and he did a demonstration, um, went away, did some more research, and did a surgery known as a leucotomy. Um, now, he then, his he, results were kind of mixed. Uh, he started out with an operation on a woman who suffered from depression and anxiety. Um, the woman seemed a lot calmer afterwards. There were some negative side effects, but Monez really kind of brushed over the negative side effects, did some more operations, and then rushed to publish this study, saying it had been hugely successful. This publication in the medical journal reached a really wide international audience, and one of the people reading was Freeman, uh, Walter Freeman in Washington, D.C., who thought, well, gosh, you know, I'm going to have a go at this myself. Um, he is, like Monez, is a neurologist. He wasn't a surgeon, so he can't operate in the United States. So he goes to see a colleague of his um, working with him, um, who's a surgeon, James Watts, and said, how about, you know, we try this ourselves? So they begin experimenting on the brains taken from bodies from the hospital morgue. Um, and they start initially by drilling holes into one on either side of the skull. Um, obviously, these operations back then before CAT scans and MRIs are done blind, but Walter Freeman, he's a neurologist, so he's got a very intimate knowledge of the structure of the brain. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, they would drill, drill through a skull, put these leucotomes, which are long surgical instruments, a bit like an ice pick, into the brain and then wiggle it around. And the idea is that they're severing connections in the brain. Um, and so they do this. And then by 1936, they think, OK, we're ready to do this on a, a live human being. Um, and so they do this. And their first operation seems to be a great success. In 1936, their patient, who is anxious and depressed, seems much calmer after the operation. They have a slightly worrying moment about a week later where her speech becomes very confused and she keeps sticking on certain words and syllables and repeating them over and over again. Um, thankfully, this passes. Um, she's sent home and you know they say it's been a terrific success. We're ready to do more. So they do a whole series of operations. And interestingly, their first batch of operations were all on women. Um, so you know they then go and the, the other really interesting thing about Freeman and that you're part of why he was such a success and um, he from the very beginning courts the press so he takes journalists and editors out to lunch he gives them he's a great showman really great PR man and um, gives them great quotes about his operation and really sells it to them and so the media become very much part of this of selling this, you know, the love of new technology and how this is going to cure the nation's psychiatric illness. Um, and so this is this is where it starts in 1936. And their initial lobotomy um, is called the, the Freeman Watts Standard Procedure. They could call it the precision method, which is kind of ironic given just how imprecise it actually was. Um, so I uh, guess, and then it's promoted in the newspapers, they get glowing press coverage and they're basically, that's them, they're on a roll and are giving permission to operate on more and more people. Did you think that he maybe got in line with the press or, you know, kind of courted the press a little bit because he might have realized that that procedure might be very shocking to a lot of people that would be hearing that for the first time like that's the thing about madness kind of history and the involvement of insane asylums is like people didn't understand mental health they didn't know a lot of these disorders and for the longest time the simple fix was send them away and they'll know what to do since they're the professionals and it really kind of brings in a bigger error when you look at like the number of people that didn't really have experience that worked at these asylums and it's like everyone's kind of figuring it all out all together now there were some people that were at the forefront but I feel like if you get the media on board, like, hey, I got this new experimental thing that's coming up. It's going to be great to be able to fix this. Then if they're already publicizing that there's this amazing new treatment, then people go, oh, I heard there's this amazing new treatment so we can try that out. And it just – I mean, of course, there's – goods and bads that come out of it as well too it's interesting to me you mentioned the first patient they did they actually want to wait to see if there would be side effects like was that conscious or did they kind of just see it later on that something's going on 
they kind of, yeah, they kind of saw it later on. They, they were quite clearly in a rush. You know, they wanted to get as many subjects done as quickly as possible. Um, and they were in a rush to get this to market, as it were, and to, to begin marketing it to a wider audience. So throughout Freeman, particularly, Watts was a much more cautious character. Um, Freeman was really eager to, you know, he just kind of glossed over the negatives and really focused on the positives of this operation and, and its potential. Um, you know, and partly he was driven by ego. He seemed to have this thing from a very young age where he was from a family of doctors. His grandfather had been a famous Civil War surgeon. Um, and he seemed to have this, you know, there was a real entitlement to him. You know, he was going to be famous one day. Um, and there's a real mixture of kind of ego and ambition with him. But undoubtedly early on, he was driven by a desire to help. And he obviously really felt that his lobotomy was the answer and it was going to help all these people suffering from mental illness in America. And, you know, initially they did say this is a, a surgery of last resort. You shouldn't hurry to have someone who's been depressed for, you know, a few weeks or a month or two lobotomized. This was something that should be done if you tried all the alternatives and they had failed. Do you think that with his, you mentioned his understanding of, you know, the brain in general, do you think that because he was very well versed in understanding the mind or the brain, at least on um, the anatomy of it, that the number of bad stuff that might have occurred on his watch or under his hand is actually very minimal to, compared to what maybe someone else with like maybe a less experience of the brain might have? Like, I mean, there are goods and bads. Obviously, it works. But at what cost as well, too. But it's also there's people it not everything works 100 percent. And I look at Walter Friedman and I see every photo I see whenever you look up the lobotomy, he's well known as the face of that. And I go, I mean, if he's the go to guy is like, this is the guy you want to go see, like everyone knows a cosmetic surgeon or something like that's the go to guy. You know, I want Kim Kardashian's cosmetic surgeon, by the way. Um, but there's there's the go to person. And that's kind of what Walter Friedman was. So, I mean, if there was another person out there that goes, I'm going to do what he's doing. I mean, would it have worked as well? Would there have been way more incidences? Because it is not, I mean, science is precise, but it also, it's science. It's like you're learning every single day. So something can go wrong. It's not 100%, like you mentioned. Yeah, I don't think, you know, if, if you wanted a lobotomy, he was the man to do it for you, you know, he and, and Watts. I guess it's more is, you know, should the surgery have ever been allowed? Um, but, you know, these these were generally people who were really desperate. They, they usually their families were really desperate for something to help their relatives. Uh, and he sold it to them, not through ill will to begin with. I don't think he just wanted to become famous. He really believed that lobotomy could help. Um, and, you know, there was clearly um, a link between. So there were basically severing connections in the brain. Um, and there was clearly this idea that, you know, if you if you severed connections between the thalamus and the frontal lobe, you're he he described it as cutting out a patient's worries that you were just you know you could stop people worrying. And the evidence was that after people were lobotomized, the vast majority of them were much less agitated. You know, if they'd been depressed, they you know seem now much calmer. If they'd been violent or you know prone to outbursts, they, these seem to have disappeared. There were time and time again families described that, um, but he he talked about it as though he was returning them to a childlike state. And I guess that's where you get into really difficult territory because often you were left with a person who was just affectless. They were neither really up nor down. They were just. Um, just kind of placid someone described them as like placid babies you know they just or like little kids who are just kind of often they would just be staring into the distance and not really terribly interested in anything around them which for many families was much better than maybe before when they'd been in a state of torment and anguish or prone to you know being really aggressive um was it preferable, you know, to go from being really, really agitated and upset to being just, you know, unconcerned by anything? You know, I guess opinions varied on that. You can um, watch an interview with a guy who got a lobotomy and it just sounds 
like there's he's like like he's like if you put a silencer on him not that he's quiet it's just that all the emotions gone it's like talking to like that's like if if you could put him in a color you would say he's gray because there's just no emotion and to me that's the scariest thing because i have adhd i'm all emotion so it's all like all over the board and giant mannerisms and everything like that so hearing and seeing that it's kind of like what and it's like the creativity aspect like the part about like what makes us us you know and i'm like look eventually you get a little carried away i'm not talking about walter friedman but i'm like if you're a family member and your kid will not you know stop screaming or yelling and they're 14 15 years old and you just go maybe it's just this is a simple way to do it where it's like that's a unethical thing obviously but i mean how do you know if someone comes to you saying that my per kid has a mental health disorder or something's wrong with my kid has madness or something it was either send him to an insane asylum or try this experimental treatment or this treatment that he was good at doing and i mean at that point i feel like you've done so many of them you probably have the confidence to be able to know exactly how to do it at least with a higher percentage rate of it not failing so but when did it when did it go bad? Like, I don't believe that he started off with bad intentions, and I don't think he really had a bad intentions at all throughout the thing. But I just kind of get to this point of like the fame had to get him. That's always what happens with every single person. It's the power and the fame just consumes who they are, and then it becomes more like a show rather than the actual treatment form. So when did that start? Yeah, and you know, I just I wanted to go back because so there's a, a quote that from his own writing, just what we were just talking for, if you don't mind me just going back a bit, um, where he himself writes that, you know, this is a major procedure. It should only be used when all other treatments had failed. And, and the quote from Freeman is, we, he and Watts, wish to emphasize that indiscriminate use of the procedure could result in vast harm. Every patient probably loses something by this operation, some spontaneity, some sparkle, some flavor of the personality. And then later they write, prefrontal lobotomy smashes the fantasy life and ruins creative capacity in doing so. One is justified in speaking of the lobotomized individual as good solid cake, but no icing. But then they would argue, you know, this to them was a small price to pay for someone who was previously ho hopeless and desperate and so anguished. Um, so yes, so he goes from this point to then the point where, and you know, he's for many, many people, he's their only hope. And so he's constantly surrounded by people who are telling him how amazing he is and how he's you know, transformed their lives or he, and he believes he has the potential to do this. He's also becomes, you know, he, he's a very respected doctor. You know, I shouldn't say, I should point out that he has, you know, he's the, hold on one second, sorry. I just want to check another quote that I wanted to give you. Um, <coughs> so he's, he's professor and chair of the neurology department at George Washington University. Um, he becomes a very popular teacher and he's famous for his dissections. So students actually bring their dates along to watch him operate because he's so you know lively and and he operates he does two-handed operations and um, you know for no reason it's just other go than to for go to a movie just take him on a movie or go walk on the beach go ride a horse i don't care just to me that's the worst date experience i would ever be on is going to go see someone give somebody a lobotomy oh my goodness so you know so he's you know people just they laugh it off and he is He's, he's arrogant and he's, you know, entitled and all the rest of it. He's also very, very charming. You know, he's a very magnetic personality. Um, and so, you know, this all, he's this kind of cult of Freeman, the lobotomy doctor. Um, and he's very, very dedicated to his work. So, you know, he will take his kids. He's got lots of kids um, and he takes them all on holiday and he'll, he'll interrupt holidays to go and do lobotomies and he'll get his kids to come along. So sometimes they sit in the, operating room while he's you know doing this at the operating theater lots of members of the press would be invited in the public local dignitaries and there's his kids and sometimes he'd even get his kids to hold the the uh, leukotomes while he would hammer them in and um, so he just you know he he's used to adulation he's very successful and um, he is undoubtedly a great you know he was a very mediocre student and indeed had his grandfather pull some strings to get him a job as director of laboratories at uh, St Elizabeth's Hospital and um, but you know he's smart he's he's a good neurologist um, and he really really believes in what he's doing and he you know he gets fantastic press coverage he writes books that are well received 
um, patients write to him and say, oh, you know, thanks so much. My relative had languished in this hospital for years and now they're home with us and, you know, they're making a bit of a go of it. They can maybe, um, they're able to help with washing up or, you know, keeping house in some way and this is a great success. And so this all feeds into his ego. Um, and yeah, so for 10 years, he's operating with Watts and um, their patients include um, Rosemary Kennedy, so uh, JFK's sister. Um, so Joe Kennedy comes along to see Freeman and Watts and says, um, you know, their daughter who had had, she'd been starved of oxygen at birth and had uh, learning difficulties. Um, and there was this feeling within the family, it was kept a secret that, you know, they were concerned that she might be an embarrassment to them. She was behaving slightly erratically and there were some suggestions that she was promiscuous and they were worried you know what what would happen she might bring shame on the family name and Joe Kennedy obviously had high hopes for all his family and um, so Watson Freeman agreed to lobotomize her uh, Joe Kennedy says you know this must be a secret I don't even want her mother to know she mustn't know and um, so you know there's no kind of informed consent here this is you know people being turned in by hospital superintendents or relatives for lobotomy uh, you know, they're not themselves agreeing to undergo the operation. Um, and so they operate on Rosemary. Um, and by this point, you know, they've experimented. Watson Freeman initially would give you an anaesthetic. You'd be knocked out. You'd get a, a general anaesthetic. And then they would start drilling. And over time, they experiment a bit. So by the time they come to operate on Rosemary Kennedy, uh, they're using a uh, local anaesthetic because they think that if they can talk to the patient, they can establish when they should stop cutting depending on their, you know, their ability to interact with them. So they're talking to Rosemary while they're operating on her. Um, they have her sing, they have her ask her questions, um, and then they decide when it's time to stop cutting. Um, and her operation was a complete disaster. You know, she was left unable to look after herself. So she was incontinent, she couldn't walk, she couldn't feed herself uh, and needed to be looked after by carers for the rest of her life. And you know, luckily for Freeman and Watts, as was often the case with operations that went very badly wrong, you know, the family didn't make a fuss about it because they didn't want people to know. Um, and so Freeman and Watts went on to do their next operations and poor Rosemary was put off into a home to be cared for for the rest of her life. Um, so, you know, there were noticeable disasters. People, people died. There was around 100 of his patients died on the operating table. But Freeman didn't let this put him off because, he, you know, he felt that for a majority of patients, they were better off after their surgery. He reckoned that, you know, around a third were well enough to go home, uh, another third improved and for maybe another third, there wasn't a huge difference. Um, and so you is getting fantastic press coverage. Um, it's being presented as an operation that's easier than curing a toothache. But as time goes on, you know, it's still an operation that's quite expensive. It still it needs an anaesthetic. You need a surgeon. You need an operating theatre. And Freeman wants to be able to, to, you know, scale up. He wants to be able to do it much more cheaply. Um, so a prefrontal lobotomy, you know, takes hours. He wants to do something faster and a lot cheaper. So he comes up with the idea. He's inspired by a surgeon, an Italian surgeon, Fiamberti, who has an operation whereby he enters the brain through the eye sockets. And Freeman thinks, wow, you know, this would be, you know, maybe I could do this. And then I wouldn't need Watts. And um, if I was able to do this without an anesthetic, I could do the operation myself. So he begins a new round of experiments in uh, the St. Elizabeth's morgue, takes, the, takes more brains from the morgue and starts operating. Um, and he devises this operation called the transorbital lobotomy. Um, so he's doing this, obviously, on dead bodies to begin with. Um, and this is in 1946. And then he does his first, first operation on a, a living patient in 1946 without telling Watts. And he does this on his own. Um, and he goes in, he uses an electric shock machine. So he gives three or four jolts of electricity to knock the patient out and then basically lifts up the eyelid, takes the leucotome, the kind of surgical instrument, puts it in above the tear duct and just hammers it in with a surgical mallet. Um, and then once it's embedded, you know, a few inches in, he gives it a wiggle around to basically sever the connection. Um, so he does that. And this is, takes it out, wipes off the, the 
instrument does the other side. Um, and, you know, he would boast that this was an operation he could do in under 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, go in for your lunchtime lobotomy. And uh, yeah, there was no need for an anaesthetic. He could do it in his office. He even at one point did this operation in a hotel room. Um, and his idea as well was that he wanted to train other doctors. So he wanted to travel America and train other doctors so that they too could do it. So, you know, you didn't need any surgical training to do this new lobotomy. Um, so it could be done in less than 10 minutes. It cost a fraction of the price. So it was about $200 typically. The private patients, he would charge a couple of thousand. Um, and his idea was, this is an operation that's just ready to go into state hospitals set myself up for a day, do as many of these lobotomies as I can do in a day, and then, you know, come back the next day or move on to another state hospital. Um, and that was his plan, you know, that he would travel around America doing this on a great scale. His daughter referred to him as the Henry Ford of lobotomy because of this kind of production line approach that he took. So I think we can say by now that things are starting to change. When Watts finds out about this, he's absolutely horrified. You know, the, the idea of someone who's not even a trained surgeon doing surgery on the brain, doing irreversible surgery. I mean, this is if you get something wrong, you can't go back. Or, you know, if there are horrible side effects, they can't be fixed. And um, so the two of them part ways at this point. Um, and it's, you know, it's the Walter Freeman show. And he is America's most prolific and most famous lobotomist. Um, and, you know, he's willing to travel around the country, he's very happy to interrupt family vacations to go and do operations. Um, and he sets his sights on Virginia and West Virginia. They're, they're handy for him because they're, you know, within driving distance of his home in Washington. Um, they're both also, luckily for him, relatively poor states, particularly in West Virginia, he has in his sights. Uh, so he begins doing operations in both states. Um, and then this formal agreement is made in the early 50s, whereby Walter Freeman will go to West Virginia beginning in 1952. And he will basically, over the course of 12 days, he does more than 200 lobotomies. Um, and just, yeah, just, you know, asks for the worst patients, but, and he will lobotomize them. Um, and, it, you know, it must, many people who were there, nurses or people who were there in the public describe, even, you know, the doctors, just, you know, what a horrifying thing it was to see that it was just, you know, one of the, there's a, a quote from um, one of the guys who helps with the operations, who, going back to what you described as like hammering nails, which really stood out for me. Let me see if I can find it. So this is Julius McLeod. So he's 18 years old and was working as a, an aide at Lakin State Hospital in West Virginia. So that was a hospital where it was all black patients staffed by an all black staff. Um, and he was given the job of holding the patients down while Freeman operated on them. And he said, when I walked in that room the first time and to see this thing, I really wanted to run. I did not want to be there to see somebody nailing what I call a nail through somebody's skull I just could not see at 18 years old how that made any sense. And that was him talking about it many, many years later. It had stayed with him as just the most horrific thing he'd ever seen. There's a couple of things. One, I want to go back to Rosemary. Rosemary is, I think there's enough evidence to support this, but JFK and RFK were the people that um, enacted the Disabilities Act. And a lot of people suggest that it was because they had a sister that suffered from disabilities because no president besides them really focused on that specific stuff, um, which is just, it's an aside. But when we talk about like him doing it in his hotel room, that's kind of where it seems like you're not doing it in the proper setting and kind of being able to travel and go to these different places. I get it. It's like not everybody can come to you, but I mean, with not the proper equipment, a hotel room makes it kind of sound like he's doing it out of like a, you know, a back alley type thing. But do you think he was viewing it as like when we talk about the aspect of celebrity, do you think he's viewing it like he's Superman? Or do you think he's viewing it like he's just a famous person that everyone wants their autograph? Do you know, I really think he believed that. Because if you're getting you know, up during Thanksgiving to were... go give a lobotomy to somebody, that's not like, that's a Superman, like they need me. And then he rip open the shirt and there's a giant Walter Friedman sign on his chest. But then there's the celebrity aspect where he's like, do I want to hang out with my family or go get autographs? 
yeah, I think it was probably a bit of both. Um, and, you know, often he would be going to places where people probably didn't have much money. So he's, you know, going to the state hospitals or sometimes to private clients. And he's, you know, they need me. I will go where the need is. Um, so, yeah, you know, he obviously got a kick out of thinking he was in demand. He, he could help people. And, you know, he let me, you know, rush and save everyone. Um, and yeah, you know, he he claimed to. So when he did, was doing the West Virginia project, he there were obviously families who didn't give permission, um, and so he said, "Well, I'll use them as a control group, and we'll you know compare what happens to them versus what happens to to the group I operate on." But he kind of you know is really not scientific. It's not rigorous. He you know he looks at his photographs of them before and after, and he'll you know have a quick kind of a well you know. 100 of mine got home within the first year whereas none of the ones I didn't operate on did you know it was all very general and simplistic and he basically looked for the evidence he needed to justify what he was doing he wasn't really interested in find, finding evidence to the contrary. When did we get to the part where he decided that he wanted his attire to have no sleeves? Yeah, I, you know he was never really one for... He had hairy arms, he, he had really hairy famous arms. Say, <laughs> he famously said I don't believe in all that germ crap so you know he didn't bother with washing and sterilizing and scrubbing up and you know he would chew gum and he was very kind of up um you know he he wasn't I'm sure he must have infected many people just with wounds getting dirty and whatever he just you know he was all about being controversial um and yeah he had bare arms and he would very theatrically you know shut throw his waistcoat or his jacket into the corner and just kind of roll up the sleeves and get on with it and you know he was he was a huckster he was a showman he was a kind of barnum and bailey kind of figure um who you know wanted to shock people he if somebody fainted while he was operating he loved it especially if it was you know a doctor and he managed to you know gross them out so much that they collapsed in the middle of one of his operations this was you know just fantastic for Walter Freeman he loved that do you did he get any criticism towards the ending like when maybe there was ever a point yeah so he did and you know yeah, and so, I mean, just to to give you, you have know, talked about the glowing kind of coverage he got. So the Washington Star described the lobotomy as one of the greatest surgical inventions of this generation. The New York Times said it was history making, a shining example of therapeutic courage that cuts away sick parts of the human personality. But, you know, there, there were negatives. Um, interestingly, um, a very senior guy in medicine had spoken out about lobotomy just in the weeks before he was given the green light to, to begin his West Virginia lobotomy campaign. And had said, you know, this is, is greatly overdone. We shouldn't be doing it. We really have rushed to get this operation out without really studying its long-term effects. You know, how are these patients one, two, five, ten 10 years after their operations? Um, but those criticisms just, seem to get overlooked but in time there was a growing kind of sense that hold on a minute we've all rushed to do this operation and you know this was really not a good idea and this was rolled out far too quickly and um, you know it was a, a really blunt instrument being used to treat a whole variety of really complex disorders um, in a way that did serious and irreversible damage to the brain you know it was a quick fix that was really not a quick fix at all and um, so you got some of the criticisms there was one former supporter in medicine who spoke out against it who characterized it as no more subtle than a gunshot to the head while a psychiatrist observed this is an operation of deduction rather than addition which did irreparable damage to that part of the brain believed to control reason and judgment uh, and time magazine ran a piece saying many patients were rendered irresponsible, tactless, indolent, placid animals, helpless for the rest of their lives. So you do see, you know, by the 50s, there's much more criticism. There is criticism throughout the 40s, but still, you know, so many operations are being done. I think it's about 50,000 in America. And I mean, just to say I'm from the UK, there were many, many lobotomies done in the UK as well. Um, we had our own kind of Walter Freeman figures in the UK who would drive around doing lobotomies just as he did in the US. Um, interestingly, also in Norway and Sweden, there were lots of lobotomies carried out. So, you know, it wasn't just an American problem. Um, 
and you saw that there were more and more people talking out about against it eventually and also there were famous cases so Rosemary Kennedy obviously that was hushed up for a long time it was Rose Williams the sister of playwright Tennessee Williams who had been lobotomized um, and she similarly ended up living in an institution for the rest of her life and Tennessee Williams was really haunted by her operation um, and drew on it in his plays um, suddenly last summer Streetcar Named Desire and Glass Menagerie and there was the film um, of Suddenly Last Summer with Elizabeth Taylor um, which you know, there was a lobotomized, a girl who was being threatened with lobotomy in it. Um, there was the Hollywood actor Warner Baxter who was lobotomized. Uh, for him, it was for chronic arthritis pain because by the end, it's not just being done for psychological illnesses, but it's being used to treat headaches, uh, postnatal depression, insomnia, um, indigestion, uh, and chronic pain in like cancer patients. So they reckon Eva Peron, Evita, a wife of the Argentinian dictator, that she had a secret lobotomy, which was for pain, um, and she died after that. Um, so, you know, just obviously there's more and more evidence and it's becoming more and more apparent that lobotomy is doing great harm. Do you think once it starts entering the area of secret lobotomy, then it's probably going to start going down a really, like, I feel like that's the push off the cliff. For if, if you're on the edge, that's the push off part is the secret lobotomy meetings, whether you're, I mean, you think you're helping or not, but it's kind of like, I mean, if you have to set that up with someone inside your family, because you know, the other side of the family might not like what you're going to be doing this and don't, or don't want this to be happening. That's just like, as a doctor, you, I would feel like you'd have to be like, oh, look, I, whether it helps or not. I mean, it's got to get everybody on board on this one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. And just the idea that you know, I made a, a radio program about the history of lobotomy for the BBC and you know I watched through old archive footage and there were doctors talking about it and they were so kind of offhand about oh yeah you know this guy is a, is violent and he's been in prison and I'm going to try a lobotomy on him just you know to see what happens and they were so cavalier and you know just talking about patients that they would lobotomize without the patients having any idea of what was about to happen to them or having, you know, one man spoke about his wife being lobotomized. And at no point did the doctor say, you know, these are the potential side effects. This is the potential harm that could be done. Um, and then this poor man and his wife, you know, she was left basically childlike. She was incontinent, she couldn't feed herself and he had to care for her. He had to give up his job and look after her 24 seven. And, you know, just the idea that this was done and that people weren't given any idea of the potential harm that could be done to them or their relatives is so horrifying to us. You know, the idea of, you know, there was no informed consent. Um, and I spoke with Howard Dully, who I don't know if you've ever had on your program, but he, he had a lobotomy and um, he would be a great guest for you to have. He had a lobotomy when he was 12 um, and he, he was one of the last people to have it done um, in the 60s. And basically his mother, his stepmother took him and he was just a 12 year old boy who didn't get on with his stepmother. And she persuaded his father to have him lobotomized. Um, and Freeman by this point, I think is so desperate for patients because basically none of the hospitals, you know, fewer and fewer of them are letting him operate. He's been stripped of his privileges. He's lost his positions in Washington. Um, and so he moves to California and he starts traveling further and further afield to find people to operate on. So he basically, you know, within a few weeks is agreeing to lobotomize this 12 year old boy. Um, and Howard Dully speaks very movingly and, you know, with great just intelligence just about what that did to him and how those, you know, less than 10 minutes on the operating table just you know totally transformed him, him forever and stripped him of so much and you know it took him more than 30 years to get his life back on track you know he dabbled in drugs and alcohol and got sent to prison and you know he was forever changed in a really really bad way after having a lobotomy that there was absolutely no medical justification for giving him it's <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about because I think we both follow each other on Instagram or not Instagram, so us Twitter. Um, I'll, yeah, I saw the lobot. I didn't know if it was real or not. I didn't think anybody would be able 
to even be able to really talk, let alone write a book on it. I mean, unless you had a ghostwriter or something, it's, you don't really hear, obviously it's an older method. They don't really do lobotomies anymore. Um, but it's just something that's so shocking that it's just kind of like, I mean, I would just feel sad the whole time. It's just like, I don't, especially if you're 12 years old and that happens to you. I mean, I can't imagine a four-year-old, like, how do you know if that, if it's just like, not just one of those children type things, it's not something that's just, they're going to grow out of. I, I have ADHD, but you know, when I was a kid, it was immediately medicate the kid. And then my parents were like, no, he'll grow out of it. And I mean, I manage it pretty well, but to an extent, it's like, I mean, you're not giving the kids a chance. I mean, how do you know if it's just them not being a child running around and stuff? But that's like the whole, like, I mean, Walter Friedman, I bet, didn't believe in therapy or did they even have an idea of what therapy was back then to handle depression? Yeah, absolutely. There was no kind of, and interestingly, one of his sons becomes a psychiatrist and, um, you know, Walter Freeman is always very competitive and, you know, any kind of competitors or rivals as he would see them in medicine. He's very childish and, and wants to put them down at every opportunity he can. Um, the other thing that we should touch on is that uh, Thorazine has come out by the early 1950s. And this was compared to a chemical lobotomy, but without the terrible side effects. And so you began to find drugs that were actually very effective at dealing with some of the worst symptoms of mental illness. Um, and obviously they didn't have that terrible irreversible quality lobotomy had you know you could tinker around with the doses try different medicines try different uh, um, you know different combinations of pills um, and so Freeman to his horror saw, saw that even in West Virginia where he'd been allowed to operate for years they began to use medications instead and you know he was just he just thought this was so misguided and that these drugs were really dangerous and and so he began to find other reasons to use lobotomy and so at one point he's given permission in West Virginia to lobotomize patients with TB because he says that lobotomy is a, a great way to help you know sort of cure TB um, and so he's you know by the end he just looks like a desperate man searching further and further afield and harder and harder for for patients and for pools of patients and you know he's offering his services for free or doing lobotomies for for next to nothing just because he wants patients and then he does you made mention of his van so he has this camper van um which by the end of his life um we haven't spoken about his so his private life's a bit of a disaster and he has a very unhappy marriage he has affairs at least one of which is with one of his patients um, anyway, towards the end of his life, he sells up everything and buys this camper van, motorhome, and drives around America with the intention of visiting all of his patients who he's operated on in the past who are still alive to see how they're doing. And he presents it as this big, important medical study, whereas, you know, he's just going in looking for evidence that what he's done has been good when other people are, you know, dissing him and saying lobotomy was this huge mistake in the history of medicine, one of the biggest, certainly. And um, he sets out to, you know, he'll take a photograph of them showing that, you know, they've got their hair brushed and makeup on and they're smartly dressed, so they must have benefited. And, um, you know, it was almost that simple and he would interview them, he would talk to their families, have a cup of tea with them. And, um, you know, do you feel that you're doing better? And, you know, often the patients, their families, um, they were grateful to him because he'd come along at a time when nobody else really seemed to be terribly interested in, in them and in helping them. And he had seemed to really care and they still held him, many of them in high regard, would send him letters, Christmas cards. So they invited him into their homes, made him welcome. And, you know, he would sit, take a photograph, write a little report and he would pour over these in his motor home at night. Um, and this for him was, you know, evidence that he'd helped people, you know, all over America. There were people who had returned to their families. You think he was trying to repair his legacy if they, when he does leave, that there would be some good stuff recorded that he did do good? Or do you think he morally was trying to come to grips that he, you know, did some good in people's lives? I think, you know, I think it was really important to him to reassure himself. And yes, I think it was really important to him that he be remembered for his legacy. He wanted to be remembered as this great uh, man who had you know, solved the nation's mental health crisis. And um, he's obviously not remembered in that way. I think he would be pleased that people still talk about him, but I think he would be very annoyed at, at the fact that he's remembered as this man who carried out this enormous medical experiment that that went so badly wrong he was in a camper van did he happen to keep a journal 
he did keep a journal and he kept, uh, yeah, he would record himself um, towards the end of his life. He was diagnosed with cancer and he would record himself, hello, this is Walter Freeman, and would discuss his career. So yeah, there's some some of those recordings are in the archive in, in uh, Washington. Did uh, his family ever mention any of the stuff that he did? Like did his kids, did they write anything about him? Did they leave any record behind on him? Yeah, well, his kids did talk about him because they, you know, it was kind of a shame for them. So he died and and they were left to to kind of justify what he'd done. And and for the most part, they did try to justify what he had done. Um, so there were two of his sons in particular who were called to kind of defend him and who who, you know, said he was very well intentioned and you know, he undoubtedly did help lots of people was their take on it. And from writing your book and kind of going through his life and understanding him a little bit deeper than probably most people do that might have like, obviously the first thing they hear about this guy going crazy and sticking the ice picks in people's eyes, they don't really get to know the person. They kind of just hear that and they're immediately disgusted. I'm not saying that you like the man. I'm saying you got to know him a little bit deeper than probably most do and kind of what society talks about if they do talk about him now does. Um, Did you... I mean, throughout it, did you did you obviously went into it knowing that there was like this horror that kind of happened? But then, I mean, did you change? I mean, did you see some good in them? Did you see mostly like just like what everyone else talks about today, which is just like how the horrendous acts of the lobotomy? Or did you kind of have a different take than most? Uh, you, you know, it's funny. I always really want to understand people's motivation, and you know, you want to find the good in people as well as the bad and you you don't want to just be swayed by what other people say and think I found him a really fascinating I mean he's a, such a flawed character he won something that happened early on that I do think was very significant so I think he he kind of grew up in the shadow of this great you know grandfather figure he had a really difficult relationship with his own father who was like an ear nose and throat doctor who I think Walter Freeman felt was a, a bit of a disappointment and you know should have achieved more he so he has a he marries Marjorie, who's obviously a very smart woman. Woman does a PhD in economics, and they have lots and lots of kids. Um, Walter Freeman isn't a particularly attentive father, and certainly doesn't seem to be a good husband. And he and Marjorie have a very difficult relationship. Um, their son dies. One of their children, Keen, who was named after his uh, Walter's grandfather. Um, dies on a trip to Yosemite they're having a hiking trip and he stops and bends down to fill his flask at the top of a, a waterfall and he loses his footing and falls in and Walter Freeman is there and can't save him and he's really this has a huge effect on him now he's already doing lobotomies at this stage and he says at one point that he sees his lobotomy work as a tribute to his dead son he always thought that that was the son who was going to go on to be a, a great doctor and there's something very dark about him he also he obviously he suffers from depression he was said to have had a breakdown but he believed the answer for him wasn't a lobotomy the answer for him was that he just should keep active he should keep busy professionally he should walk he was a great man for walking you know he could walk his demons away um he didn't sleep well he was obviously a workaholic he would pop drugs to get him to sleep he would take three or four sleeping pills um and he just seems this rather sad and tragic figure by the end, um, who's so determined to believe his own hype. Um, despite, you know, you just think, how on earth could he believe that he'd done all this good? There was so much evidence of the bad that he had done. Um, and there was this rather sad meeting he went to, which one of his sons was at, the son who was a psychiatrist, where he was basically mocked by the doctors. You know, his moment had passed and they were saying, you know, what do you mean lobotomy? This, you know, it's so clear. This was a huge mistake. Uh, and he has this box with him and he tips out all these Christmas cards and letters from patients, families, and says, you know, look, this is evidence of the good that I've done. These people love me. You know, they tell me I'm a hero. I saved them. I saved their relatives. Um, and it's just such a sad image of this deluded figure um that you know I, I find I feel sorry for him I feel much more sorry for the people whose lives he ruined but I feel sorry for him too well I mean you gotta imagine the number of people in the beginning that were probably like I mean 
they want to have, like, like I said, autographs, all this type of stuff that's going on. I mean, you're, you're at a peak and it's everyone hits a peak. Everyone knows when they're, I mean, you don't know when your peak is, but afterwards you kind of know that that was your peak back then. I mean, that's him. He's looking now at his older life and he's kind of looking back and he goes, I mean, he's trying to still feel relevant in a sense. And you realize that the times have kind of moved on. Um, it's that legacy aspect. I wonder if his great, if his grandfather, great grandfather, whoever was famous, I wonder if they, he didn't have that figure in his family. Would he have that need? It's ego. I have ego. Um, so I don't like compliments a whole lot is because it feeds the ego and it's like, you got to keep that in check. But I mean, if you let it go crazy, it's like being a celebrity. That's why every celebrity has like some type of giant, like crazy outburst or like Britney Spears shaving her head. You just, you can't, you can't, there's nobody in the world is equipped to deal with all that and then keep it going. Cause you want it to last forever. I mean, it feels great, but at the same time it, it fades away. And then Walter Friedman, I mean, if he, you think if you didn't have that figure in his life that had such good credentials or did some type of impact, do you think that maybe he would have this kind of ego or this kind of drive to be in the light a little bit? You know, I, I don't know. He just cert he certainly just seemed to be very much, I will be famous, almost like he deserved to be famous or that was his destiny. Um, and he, you know, one thing that really struck me actually is, you know, I guess the idea that doctors, psychiatrists, you know, this certainly of that era saw patients not necessarily as human beings, but just as kind of specimens. And it's very much there's a, a quote from Walter Freeman when he would walk the wards at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And he talked about the patients not with compassion, but with he was kind of disgusted and revolted by them. Um, and so, you know, his desire to help them wasn't a kind of human, oh, you know, I want to make your lives better. It was a, there was a scientific quality to it. I mean, he obviously wanted to do good, but he wanted to to transform the world of of medicine and psychiatric medicine. And he just comes over as a kind of sad and rather obviously very misguided, but just kind of you, know, you wonder where the well, he seemed not to have very close relationships with anyone. And I guess maybe that's also part of the problem. You know, say you have a bunch of close friends, family, a partner that you talk to or kids and parents. And, um, you know, maybe they say to you, hey, you know, this project you're doing at work, this new operation, you know, are you sure it's entirely good? And I just wonder whether was there anyone in his life who would do that? Possibly it was the kind of character that he would just, you know, he would just cut you out if you question what he was doing but you know you kind of wonder where those checks and balances came from he just seemed to be on a one-man mission and very blinkered Typ typically around a figure like that that kind of they usually pick up a protege or they pick up some type of young apprentice that they can kind of tell stories to or bounce their thoughts off of or even hold his tool bag when he's doing some of his lobotomies and things of that sort. It's interesting. I, I would think he would have went towards one of his kids, but if he was distant, I mean, that just creates paranoia. It's isolation. And if you're trying to bounce ideas, like, do you think this is a good idea? The only person you're talking to is yourself. So it's like, of course, you're gonna be like, yeah, it's a good idea. You know, there's not a whole lot of like criticism or anything. If you're going to maybe, you know, give it up, you know, that type of aspect of things. And you just end up being alone and driving the paranoia even farther. It's like Leonardo da Vinci, one of my favorite characters, but I mean, he had a bunch of apprentices and it's like, yeah, I mean, all that crazy or all those uh, creative craziness that's in his head. I was like, I mean, at least he had, he had different apprentices, but he was bouncing off ideas off these guys because he wanted someone to help him. Is this a good idea? Is this good? You know, let me try this out and you tell me if it's good. That's what you need. And I mean, I don't know, going in a van and then doing your tours that way at that point, it's just like, man. That's not the right. That's like Timothy Leary set and setting. That ain't the right set and setting. I'll tell you that. I know, and he, uh, you know, he was so determined to emphasize his own operation. You know, his uh, transorbital lobotomy, which he did through the eye sockets. He was so desperate to sell this as you know, really easy. It's cheap. It's quick. It can be done anywhere by anyone. You know, he did his record was like 80 operations in one day and um, that he, you know, he rushed around the country training other doctors to do it. And so, you know, in that, that their speed, his speed and their desire to quickly begin doing these operations led to so many botched operations by people, you know, his desire to emphasize how easy it was and how, you know, you needed no surgical experience just 
did so much harm because he was so determined to sell it as, you know, here's a, as one newspaper said, it was easier than curing a toothache. And, you know, this idea that a quick fix that you could have done in your break and you were, you know, that was you, all your psychiatric problems were solved and you were ready to go. And just, you know, caused so much damage. Well, look, it's easy for me to make my own peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but I still like it when someone does it for me. So that doesn't mean it's right. Um, but I appreciate the time you gave me to talk about this, um, on my show. Um, do you have a place where people can find any of your links, your book, uh, website, Twitter handle, anything like that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, my website is clareprentice.org. That's C-L-A-I-R-E-P-R-E-N-T-I-C-E.org. Um, and yes, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Um, all the details are on my website. So yeah thanks for having me on the show it's been a great pleasure to talk to you and one last question which is if you were going to write another book on something another figure it can be a medical figure it can be a historical figure it can be anything you want please tell me you're going to choose someone with like a like a happier kind of past a little bit like i i don't know bob ross's is really dark i would have suggested him but his is a horrible past i knew it it's not working on and you know when I was working on Dr. Icepick I could see them recoil it's like you know gosh you you don't seem like you would be so obsessed with really dark things but there's just something about some of these dark stories that's just really fascinating I think it tells us a lot about ourselves and our our views of other people in the world around us so I have actually just had another book come out Curse of Riches which is about a very dysfunctional New York family they were around at the same time as the Astors they were related to the Astors and had huge uh, real estate holdings they made their money through property at the time when New York was developing and they're really 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 dysfunctional and it's the story of them and what becomes of them um, and that's Curse of Riches and I'm also just at the moment actually starting to look at another project it's another medical project which isn't so dark as Dr. Icebeck so okay well I'm going to link your links in the description it's been a pleasure chatting with you and thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast